Inuits? Yeah. Good old Dave. Man. Yeah? Did you guys talk for a while? Me and Dave Patowski? Yeah. Yeah, I've never met him. But boy, does he love buttons. Really? Yeah. I think it's actually Dan. Dan Patowski? Oh, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, Dave's his cousin. Right. Yeah, yeah. Same family, different dude. Sorry. No, I was thinking about uh, Josh. Oh, yeah, That's yeah. What, I was asking a real question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> I don't know. Because I'm an asshole. Yeah. Turns out I did know. <laughs> so hello and welcome to Idiots with Instruments, the show that follows Red Hot Rebellion as we do funny things and do interesting things and do things that matter in the world with the music industry, with our lives, with the world in general. I am James R. Tramontana, rock and roll bassist of Red Hot Rebellion. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Doug Spencer. <laughs> And I'm a giant asshole. <laughs> Doug, your voice sounded very different there uh, from the See, now people first thing you said and the second <laughs> thing you said. There. Is that better? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah there it is. Yeah, totally okay. better. Uh, I'm Andres. I play the drums. Do Are we saying that still? Yeah. You should know that by now. <laughs> I would hope well, people who listen. Maybe this is the first time That's they're true. hearing it. Maybe so, this is the first time somebody Yeah, so if to. this is your first uh, hey, time, my welcome. Name's, <laughs> my name's Andres, and I play the drums. He plays the drums. And we are a three-piece rock and roll band, and uh, we uh, play rock and roll. And yeah. we're currently writing and recording our new album, which is um, tentatively called, entitled, Not for Human Consumption. Yeah. That's, that? the, that's the working title, for sure. It's yeah. true. It's on the board. <laughs> it's right on the board. <laughs> It is on the board. <laughs> and today we have a fantastic interview with the one and only Josh Rabinowitz, who is a, a really fancy uh, music executive who works in the advertising world. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And nice. we learn all about music in advertising, advertising in general, and of course, the best place to get a slice of pie in New York City. New York City. <laughs> New York City. <laughs> So what do you say we run that interview right now? <laughs> Joining us today is Josh Rabinowitz, Executive Vice President and Director of Music at Gray Townhouse WPP, where he heads up the United States' largest in-house music team and services major international advertising clientele. Josh is widely recognized as an industry leader in music supervision, content production, and programming, and is considered by many to be the voice of music in branding and advertising. Josh, thank you so much for slumming it with us today. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you doing? Doing all right. So Excellent. I was wondering if uh, you could please tell us a little bit about some of the brands you work with and the role music plays in their advertising and brand identity. I would love to tell you about that. So Gray Advertising has a, a slew of blue chip clients. Many of them are under the Procter & Gamble umbrella. Okay, yeah. Those include Gillette, Downey, Febreze, um, and we do a whole lot of work for them. Pantene, oh, wow. uh, Gillette and Pantene are at a global level, and the other ones I mentioned are more at a national level. Uh, other brands that we work with are Marriott Hotels, the NFL, um, Volvo Cars. Um, those are some of the major ones. Lots of pharmaceutical companies. And music is a very important part of many of those brands. Uh, it identifies kind of a sonic identity, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, much of the music helps tell the story. Uh, also, the music can be really culturally relevant and helps kind of break the brand through the clutter of other things by identifying it with really cool culturally important mm. music mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and how does how would you say like licensing music for advertising campaigns differs from say like tv shows and movies or is it a similar type process i mean it is a similar type process i would say probably advertising spends more money on music than those other aspects those other parts of media mm -hmm. um a 30 second commercial could it, it, it all depends on the amount that it's used and where it's used if it's national international local if it's just tv or if it's tv and media or if it's tv and cinema or right. if it's social media so 
Um, that all being said, advertising, because it's corporate dollars, uh, sometimes can throw down a, a pretty significant amount of money. And, and the musicians and the composers and the rights holders can do very well. Right. Yeah. We um, we recently spoke to um, a, mu- a freelance music supervisor who mainly focuses on uh, TV and film. So we are very interested to hear your world um, in more depth, because like for me personally, uh, I'm a uh, indie musician and publisher and song plugger I've done in the past. And um, all my experience has been with uh, film and TV and video games and web, but never in the field of advertising. So I'm very excited to talk to you. <laughs> um, Excellent. How do you find music? Uh, uh, do you send briefs to publishers and labels? Do you have comp- in-house composers that that custom create? What's uh, what's your process? Well, there's no definitive process. We have a team of six people, um, and all the accounts are broken down amongst the different music producers slash supervisors. So, mm-hmm. uh, half of what we do is original music created specifically for the execution, and half of it is licensed. When we're licensing music. If there's a lyrical kind of important thing that we're looking for, we might send out a brief to a publisher or a third party that might represent a publisher or a label or an artist. Um, And we have a really great network. Obviously, people really that control the rights to songs really, really want to get their songs into advertising because of Mm -hmm. the financial aspect, but also because of music discovery. And it could be a really great way to break a brand into culture. Um, but we, our value to the agency and to our clients is that we know a lot about music. Some more, some know more about different kinds of music. We're all different ages, different fans of different things, but we know a lot about music. So sp- generally speaking, we like to kind of find the music based on the discussions we have with our clients and our mm-hmm. internal creative teams rather than reaching out. So Oftentimes when we reach out to a publisher, we already know what the song is and then we're going to go into a negotiation or to the right, label. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So do Can we hold it just for a sec? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> okay, just give me like 30 seconds. Okie doke. Okay. Sorted, sorted. That was quick. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're back at it. So, um... Can uh, do you uh, do people ever do publishers or, or um, composers pitch directly at you or to you? And is that even a possibility, or is it because you already have an idea, the brand has an idea, there's a creative concept that that just doesn't really happen? It does. I mean, people okay. send stuff to us all the time. Uh, there's an infinitude of music that comes through to our teams. We're invited to shows to see new artists. We're invited to showcases. Uh, we go to conferences, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so. Yeah, what the value is in all that is that we know great new music. We know what's kind of emerging and coming on. Uh, A a lot of the times people are going to send you the priorities uh, that they have on their labels. Um, Specifically, publishers don't always have priorities as much as the labels do. So we're kind of in the know. And I think that kind of symbiotic relationship with all the rights holders is is really excellent for us for music discovery, but also just to kind of know what's coming in uh what might uh be on the horizon and then we it, it's also great to know to, to meet some of these artists and to see them and kind of talk about maybe getting them to be involved uh in creating specific bespoke music custom-made music for an ad right 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 um and this is an area that I'm a little ignorant on, so I'm hoping you can uh, help me out. Does uh, performance royalties work the same way for music and advertising as it does in TV and, and movies? Like, would when a music when music is used, like say in a Gillette commercial, is that um, showing up on uh, like ASCAP uh, cue sheets and that type of thing, or is it completely bypassed? It's not bypassed at all. It certainly is. Um, we administrate that stuff. We often use a third party to track that stuff. And, you know, we, we besides being kind of creative resources, we are also a, bi- a business resource. And that's part of our kind of our workload right. is to make sure that all the rights holders are, are collecting their performance royalties and everything's registered correctly. All the dollar signs are, or the numbers are right. <laughs> right. Uh, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed in the agreements. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And um, so when you are 
you guys are kind of like you work with with the the creative team. How many gatekeepers or like fingers in the pie are there on on a typical like campaign? Like, because everyone has an opinion on music, so they sure do. <laughs> and it, there is a plethora. Sometimes there are too many. Right. Um, and how do you manage and- that? How do we manage that? Yeah. Uh, we do our best. Um, <laughs> sometimes uh, there is an amazing trust with the music person that's involved with the account. And people just go to us and say, okay, we we love what you did before and we know you have great taste. Others, they might not... Um, they might not dispute our taste. They just feel like they really need to be heavily involved. Thus, all the different cooks in the kitchen. Right. And let's, I can kind of list some of the cooks in the kitchen. Uh, certainly the music person is, is heavily involved in the music process, but so are the creative teams. And on the creative teams, there might be an art director and a copywriter, then a uh, associate creative director, a executive creative director, a group creative director, or a worldwide creative director. Uh, <laughs> There might also be a producer and then an executive producer. There might be account people that are really well connected in and that liaise with the clients. And then there might be a whole level of clients. Uh, The best successes I've had is where there's kind of an implicit trust amongst all the parties and everyone kind of understands what their area of expertise is. Um, That's when I've had the most success in my career. Most, Most of the award winning stuff has gone down that way. But I understand people have to kind of uh, show their value in the process so they want to add their little spice into the soup if you will right and um that's a very common occurrence have you seen ever seen things like a uh, particular music is gone up the line up the line it's cleared 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 and then knocked down by someone way at the top of the food chain does that happen often yeah certainly <laughs> it climbs up the food chain or the totem pole <laughs> we're almost there and then all of a sudden there's a, a, a Back to square distinct one. voice that comes in and says nah um, you know, some people don't understand music and some people do, uh, when they don't understand it, they might know what works. They just don't know how to express it. Uh, so someone may request something and they're not articulating it in, in, you know, a musician's manner, if right. you will. Yeah. And That's you, not to say that you're, you yourself are a musician as well, right? Yeah. And, and right. all the people that I've hired on my team have musical experience, mm. varied musical experience, um, and also corporate experience to an extent because, As I mentioned, there's so many people that you have to deal with, collaborators, that you have to understand kind of how to manage that in a productive way rather than kind of an unproductive, conflicted way. Right, yeah. Yeah. And um, is do you find that the the creative and the the corporate environments, do they mesh well uh, for you or is it kind of, uh, do they butt heads? Uh, Hold on a second because there's an ambulance coming by. (laughs) We are in New York. Never. Um, Every time we talk to someone in New York, this happens, so it's okay. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I tried to find a spot to go inside, but there are too many people around my house right now. It lends to the authenticity. (laughs) Yeah, could you repeat the question? Sorry. The question was, um, do you find the creative creative and the corporate uh, work well together, or is it um, sometimes a um, uh, like a butting of heads? It can be a butting of heads. Yeah. A lot of it is about trust, like I mentioned, and kind of a a respect for the process. What I'm finding is people that haven't really swam in kind of the advertising, music meets media, um, waters, they don't understand the process necessarily. Mm. And a lot of people don't know the value of music, right? Um, Right. Many people were born digital, and or they're innately digital, and they think the value of music can be free because much of the music that they get is free. Right. So, you know, you have to understand that there's a budget. Um, We might only have a couple of thousand of dollars, a couple thousand dollars, or we might have 500 or or less for a social media thing. Um, People will will be like, yeah, let's get a Coldplay song. And I'm like, (laughs) well, I I don't think you can. (laughs) And they're like, well, at least look into it. And, you know, those are people that might not have uh, participated in music in the media uh, professionally before. So some some of it is like an education thing, but yeah, there's oftentimes a rub between commerce and music, corporate commerce and the artistic side of music. But I think the way it the hierarchy is set up with all the different collaborators that I mentioned, mm-hmm. 
because there are people that have some of the wisdom and experience at the top, um, besides the vision, they understand that stuff. So oftentimes if, if myself or my team is encountering people that don't get it, we might say to someone more senior, okay, uh, can you talk to your people? Because right. I don't think they get it and it's just going to be a waste of time and energy. Um, so the rub might disappear. But yeah, art yeah. and commerce don't always meet. Right. Um, yeah, and has the people, ja- the job changed over the years? Do you find that it's it's evolved and since you've been doing this? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing it for a while. Yeah. When I started out, the area of expertise for, we were called music producers at, at that point, was that you're someone who understands how to work with musicians, you're comfortable in the studio, you understand the process of creating original music. I mean, there wasn't a lot of licensing going on when I started in the 90s. Mm. It started to kind of creep in, and, and then it became more about licensing and finding famous songs or emerging songs that may become famous or would make a brand look super cool, like I said in the beginning of the, our discussion. Right. And now it's more about people that pick out great tracks and have great relationships um, and have good taste. It's not that people didn't have good taste before, but they were able to live to deliver original music based on a brief where now it's not all original music. It's about 50% and 50%. Mm -hmm. Do you work with a lot of music libraries now? Because I know in in the past library music was pretty cruddy, but these days it sounds like it's getting way, way better. That's an excellent question. I definitely deal with a lot of library music Um, and it's very good quality. Uh, I've developed excellent relationships with a lot of these companies, and I think they are the future. Um, mm-hmm. There has been a devaluation in music, um, and a lot of people that used to make a, a buttload of money um, making records and producing records, they don't have the opportunity to do so anymore. Right. So it's they have migrated into our world, and they understand the process, and many of them are involved in, in libraries and creating their own libraries or creating music for specific libraries. Yeah. So instead of, you know, making, you know, 30, 50, a hundred grand on a track, they might make, um, for a license, maybe a few hundred bucks or a few thousand bucks, but they might do many of those kind of deals. And, right. and that's why the libraries are doing well. Would you advise like say, uh, newer indie musicians to get their music in libraries or kind of try it out themselves, become their own library or are we, are we there yet? Um, I, I would recommend certainly doing the research and finding out some of the really great libraries that are out there, um, and, and aligning with them. Um, it's a great way to get your music out there. Obviously there are an infinitude of them, right. um, some of the bigger ones uh, are extreme music or audio network, APM, associated production music, five alarm, uh, and others. And they've had a, three, a track record of success over many years, but more and more are coming into play. Uh, other bigger publishers are starting to aggregate some of these libraries so they can have more volume. Um, it's a great way to get in. And there are some that charge like very little money for the license but I know people that deal with those and they say sometimes a track is licensed like a hundred times in a year. Mm. Maybe they're only making 50 bucks on one, but on another, they might make 500 or a thousand. So it right. kind of, it works out for many people. Yeah. 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 And uh, like, do you, the bigger ones, do they do like the, uh, um, like publishing splits? Like, well, they'll retitle your song and split the publishing with you. And then some do yeah. and some don't. Um, the interesting thing about retitling, which I'm not really incredibly psyched about, is I did come from the music house side, the, those companies that do create original music specifically. Um, and, you know, when you work for someone uh, in one of those companies, you're essentially the writer, but they are uh, keeping a, a writer's share as well because they're mm-hmm. the ones that brought the work in and it's their company and you're working under their shingle, you know. So... <laughs> I, I have difficulty with retitling, but you know I have worked in that space for ver- for a very long time on the music house side, so I, I can relate to the concept at least. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not yeah. sure I support it. But. Yeah, yeah, right. It's it's kind of the nature of the beast these days. I guess a lot of a lot of indies. That's that's the option they have. 
um, is you well you can get in this uh, jump in this pool with us, but we're gonna retitle your stuff. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, if, if someone's gonna bring in the work, it, it's yeah. all about significant relationships, right? Some right. people don't have them, so if somebody has them and they're making this uh, deal for you and they're creating this business, this work for you. It's something that you have to deal with. Right. Obviously, if you're someone who's really visionary and doesn't want that to happen and has the capacity to kind of create your own business model, market it, uh, develop the relationships and create great music, you should do it on your own. But uh, most people don't have all those qualities. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a big, wide world of there. And um, yeah. I've seen your name come up several times at different conferences around the world. Like you're at Con, you're at Medem, Sync Summit. Um, do you find you travel more now as an executive than you did as a musician back in the day? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I traveled locally um, more as a musician uh, than I do internationally as a speaker or a keynote or like a, a mm -hmm. presenter if you will just because you know i was in a band that played 200 nights a year so that's a lot more traveling than mm -hmm. i do i do now but i do travel to pretty interesting distinct places going to singapore this year oh, wow. i was invited to budapest i'm going to go to amsterdam and i was just in france and in scotland one of my favorite countries and Cool. I know that there's things in Denmark and Iceland. You know, what's, what's really interesting about all that is I'm, I'm a little older than, than some of the other people that are in the business. I was one of the first people really, and it's not patting myself on the back. I'm just the kind of the timing happened that way. I'm one of the first people to kind of really start talking about and speaking in public about music and advertising and marketing mm -hmm. and branding. That's why I think I'm kind of considered the voice the voice <laughs> because i had been doing it for so long at yeah. the can lions festival of creativity a really great gathering of, of brands advertisers and technologists and 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 production people and music people i was the only music guy presenting there like 15 mm. years ago you know flash forward to this past june um there must have been a hundred people presenting oh, wow. on music yeah. and shows and stuff so it's a different kind of thing. And are you there yeah. like scouting music and brands or is your role more like, are you just uh, paying it forward, sharing the information or what's, what, what do you do? Yeah. Doing? I mean, I love to pay it forward. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up and you know, I'm really into karma, not at the spiritual level more, just like a kind of uh, objectified level. Uh -huh. I, I, why I go to conferences is mainly to meet people, to speak with them, to learn stuff, to create a network and to help people. And one of the things that I have done is anytime anyone really asks to meet that, you know, comes to a recommended source or a reliable source, I meet with them, try mm -hmm. to listen to their music, have my team listen to their music, mm -hmm. you know, discovery and coming up with that, you know, diamond in the rough and, and kind of creating right. a trend is yeah. really something of value uh, to us and valuable to our clients. Yeah. It's like, you guys are like the, the cool rock star A and R reps of the modern age kind of out there. In, in a way we can be, <laughs> uh, not everything we do is in that spectrum and, and so cool, but some of it is, you know, um, you can imagine you see a lot of advertising. You've probably seen a ton of advertising in your life. Like we all have. Right. And, uh, it's, it's definitely, sorry, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Cool. Those guys aren't doing anything. Okay. I'm on a, uh, an interview. So I'll be Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're we're almost wrapped up here. So I, no, it's totally cool. I just okay. saw someone I know in the street. Oh, cool. That's the problem. <laughs> Living in Brooklyn, you ah, see people beautiful. you know all the time. It's a walk-in city. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me just say, for a fancy executive, you're amazingly responsive in emails. So I can just imagine like uh, how much of a people person you are at conferences. So that's that's really cool. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I really enjoy public speaking. I'm a I'm a adjunct professor also i've been teaching oh, cool. for 10 years at the new school in new york and at the nyu steinhardt school of music wow. professions the music business program they have there i love teaching i love uh speaking and meeting people to me i don't know it's, it's all about the people you know and your reputation right so like right, there yeah. might be someone who has super amazing taste and comes up with this like really cutting edge brilliant like hipster track for an amazing piece of work uh, but they might be a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, exactly. like, you know, I've been in this thing for a long time for a reason because I'm not a douchebag. Douche I'm very responsive and I really respect people and I want people to respect me. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's a tough business to have that kind yeah. of quality. I, I, I assure you. 
um, I'll, a piece of advice I have for a lot of people is don't always engage because sometimes you're going to like I've written probably a thousand emails in my life that I've not sent. You know, right. I've like it's almost like a, a bit of therapy. Someone does something really ridiculous and mean and kind of cruel and unethical mm -hmm. and I'll kind of comment on it in an email and then I just decide, hmm. Not worth How it. far is this going to go? Yeah. What What am I going to benefit? How am I going to benefit from this? I don't think at all. It's just going to make stuff worse. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Staying positive. Keep it above board. I got gotcha. you. Trying. Uh, it's trying. <laughs> yeah. And I guess as far as uh, you mentioned advice, uh, like what advice could you give to like musicians and bands who want to license their music for advertising? Uh, yeah. I have a few pieces of advice. Certainly you have to kind of understand the people that are the gatekeepers, right? And what their role is and what their value is. And, you know, many people have songs and they're just like, look, man, this song is perfect for this Gillette ad or perfect for the NFL. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a lot of the gatekeepers don't want people to tell them what's perfect because they want to be the creative gatekeeper. They want to be the person that kind of comes up with the idea. You know, that's what their value is. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if something is perfect, uh, they're going to realize it. Uh, hopefully the music person should, uh, the creative person likely will. It's kind of presenting it to them in a way that you're not kind of saying, look, this is it. You know, this is right. my idea and it's an amazing idea. Kind of get them to think it's their idea if you can. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's it's, amazing. it's true. Yeah. Just based on like kind of, uh, professional, um, you know, uh, importance for them and their value and, it's professional survival. You know, they have to have some kind of say in things. If, if they're just like kind of just following what other people say all the time, it's not always going to work out for them. Right. right. Uh, other advice is look at the work. That's great. Um, understand what's great work. Understand the people that are involved in the great work. Gosh, there's so much great work out there. Um, and if you figure out who all the players are and kind of understand what the process was, and uh, connect with these people, you know, uh, and you kind of get, you know, understand the way they think, um, that really helps you. And those are the two pieces of advice that I think are, are, are pretty significant. Obviously having a great network is super important. Mm -hmm. Um, having good music helps if your music is not so good, <laughs> you know, and if your music is dark or like very attitudinal, there's not a lot of space for it. Not that there isn't space for it. Mm -hmm. It's just, that's kind of the way it goes. You, most of the music is fairly positive or has a warmth to it. Or if there is a darkness, it's a bittersweetness. It's not like a super dark right. aggressiveness. Yeah. Sometimes there's aggressive music. Uh, sometimes there's really like kind of like gangster rap and, and mm -hmm. death metal and stuff like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. It could be funny or it could be really culturally relevant to what's going on. But most of the time it's about things that kind of build and help tell a story and are positive. Right. Yeah. Mm hmm. And um, since you are in New York City, where is the best place to get a slice? That is a great question, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a very um, there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, <laughs> What's your favorite place? See, I'm older school where I like thinner crust, mm -hmm. and I don't mind it being kind of like sweet sauce because it's kind of like what I grew up with, right? So. I have a couple of places in my neighborhood that I go to, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't highly recommend them to the general public. It's like trying to, re you know, kind of um, give people suggestions on music, right? Like, right. yeah, I really like this music, but you might not like it. So um, w there's a place in the village called Joe's. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the West Village. It's been around for a while. I think that place is great. Um, I always think you should have a Coke when you have a slice. You can have wine or beer, but I think a Coke goes best. Yeah. They have the Mexican Coke, which is the sweet oh, Coke in yeah, the bottle. With the real sugar, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. You know, um, There are other slices in the Bronx, uh, in Queens, you know, parts of Brooklyn. People will argue and argue <laughs> till they're blue in the face. But I think if you go to Joe's in the West Village – you're not going to debate wrong. that it's an excellent slice. Yeah. <laughs> it's irrefutable. Yeah. 
Always got to ask, like every time we talk to someone in New York, we have to ask where's the be- their favorite place to get a slice. And uh, Joe's has yeah. come up a couple times, so I'm glad to, glad to you, hear you it. You can't go wrong with it, you know? You That's can't awesome. go wrong. And on Facebook, people are like, coming to New York, I have a kid. My kid's never really had New York pizza. What should I do? What I would suggest is don't get a slice, but go to like, you know, Titano or go to um, like – Grimaldi's mm-hmm. or something like that where they sell whole pies and they're yeah. just like spectacular pizza. But you know, if by the slice, I think you can't go wrong with Joe's. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, where can people connect with you online and in the real world? Where's your next uh, conference here or what happened? Let's see. I am going to Singapore for Music Matters. Um, that's in September. That's the next conference. I'll be at the Amsterdam dance event, which has become this huge monster conference in Amsterdam in November. M is from Montreal is uh, also in November. That's in Montreal. Um, there are great ways to just kind of stay in contact with me is via email. Mm-hmm. Obviously I'm responsive to it. Yes, you are. Not always, <laughs> um, you know, depending if I'm traveling or if there's some kind of like, uh, deadline or right. I have a shotgun to my head figuratively. Um, you know, I'm reachable by email, social media. Are you a Twitter uh, yeah, guy? Conferences you on, is usually best. Are you on the Twitter, the, the face place, that whole thing, or I'm on the face place. I'm on the gram. Um, the gram. Yep. I'm on Twitter. Okay. Cool. Uh, LinkedIn is actually not a bad place. Oh, I feel yeah. like to mm-hmm. connect with people, there's a sense of business, uh, respectability that's associated with it. Yeah. 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 Well, very good. Well, Josh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. This has been very illuminating and and informative, and I really appreciate it. And thanks for the pizza talk as well. Oh, yeah, I'm starving now. And uh, I I like the questions you had. Um, They were excellent and, and, you know, definitely poignant and to the point. Sometimes people are always uh, asking questions about, okay, well, how can I get my music into this? You know, Mm -hmm. I have this kind of music, you know, how much money, you know, I I, want to be like, great, if this is what I want to do and what, how can I make a lot of money doing it? So, you know, I'm, uh, these were excellent questions and I really appreciate that. Hooray. Well, if, um, there was a Yelp for interviews, I'd appreciate a five star, but you know, your, 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 um, kudos goes much longer than any Yelp review could possibly go. So (laughs) (laughs) so nice of you. (laughs) Thanks again. And I hope to talk to you in the future and, uh, yeah, maybe I'll see you at a conference one of these days. Yeah, that would be great. There used to be a lot more billboard conferences. They just don't have as much these days because the billboard business model is shifting. I used to participate in like four of those a year, five of those, and they were all over the place. I missed them. Well, I'm sure we'll we'll run into each other some some fine day. And um, thanks again, Josh. I really appreciate it. Josh Rabinowitz, you have yourself a lovely afternoon. You too. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Excellent. So that'll do it for this episode of Idiots with Instruments. My name is Jim Tramontana, reminding you to keep it simple. Hey, my name's Doug, and I'm saying stay hydrated. I'm Andres, and uh, I'm saying never play acoustic. Bye-bye. Idiots with Instruments is a solid arts and science production. All rights reserved throughout the multiverse. Please subscribe and review the show on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Visit idiotswithinstruments.com for exclusive bonus material and to support or sponsor this show.